Brava, Carol, and Brava, Gabriella Frank. I want to welcome you all, two West Coasts and two New Yorkers. And Gabriella, will you talk about your music for a brief moment? Um, one of your pieces is called A Song, and the other, Carol's uh, performance, is called Improvisations. Of course, it's all written out. How did you see those as two different ways of composition? You know, one of the things that um, composers have to be very mindful of is not repeating ourselves. And I happen to have in the can two flute and piano works at the same time for two marvelous artists. So it's a real skill to be able to channel your creativity. And one of the things that you can do is to set up strikingly different premises. So as you'll see in the piece written for Demar, it's a, it's a one movement work that has some sections to it, but it pretty much goes from the very beginning. And the piano part is really um, a weighty partner. Then for Carol's piece, I did something completely different with five shorter little works, equally virtuoso, but that is very playful and much more witty. It turns these phrases that are, are disparate phrases that really takes somebody who's uh, a consummate lyricist in order to be able to, to convey. And um, it really profiles the flute. And I think of the other, the canto, like an art song in which the piano is as important as the singer in telling the story. And so I held up a different task for myself as I was writing the Mars piece. I was looking at the piano part separately and then the flute part separately and saying, if this were just a solo flute work, could it stand alone? If there were just a piano work, could it stand alone? But for Carol's piece, they're together. They're very much together as one. So completely different premises set up will set you for success if you are so lucky you know, as to have two similar instrumentations that you are creating music for. We are very grateful to that for that. And could you also speak a little bit about where you find your musical sources, your Peruvian, your Quechuan sources. Did you go in the bush? Did you find recordings? How did you learn about this music? Um, well, my mother is from the, the beautiful and small Andean nation of Peru. And while Andean music got popularized in the West in the 70s and 80s, particularly where you started seeing because of all the turmoil that was happening in Latin America. A lot of musicians were coming out of places like Chile in the fallout between Allende and Pinochet and La Guerra Sucia and the Dirty War in Argentina. And even in Peru, we had the Sendero Luminoso, the Shining Path. So I was exposed to the music in, in terms of musicians coming out and going to places that were hospitable to hearing Andean music like San Francisco, New York, uh, Helsinki, Madrid, I mean, these, these hotspots around the world gave you know, popularity to instruments like the kena or the, the, the multiplicity of panpipe flutes that you will see, panpipes of every size and every color. And, and so this was an inspiration for me, even, yeah, this one, that one looks like a, what Carol was just holding, it looks like a sikuru, a sikuri, excuse me, it's a smaller one. And kind of difficult to play. The smallest pipe is it's 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 hard. It's really hard. And these are often instruments made by the in, the instrument player themselves. There is a whole different culture and relationships to wind instruments when uh, when when you are bereft of resources. So I had exposure as a young girl growing up in Berkeley, and then I began to travel in Peru myself. Uh, and this would be during grad school. And I wasn't getting the kind of exposure to Latin American music and the classical music conservatory and realized that I had to find this for myself. And so I was able to get support, a little bit of support within the music school, but I went to departments like women's studies and romance languages, Latin American studies. They were all so happy to have a musician applying for their grants rather than the usual uh, student majoring in that department. I was really strategic. And I got money that would begin to send me to Latin America. And at the time, you know, 
people were going to Europe for classical music. They weren't going to Peru for classical music. And talking about the lack of representation of people in color wasn't in the air as it's become even just this past year. I mean, this is a moment that I've been waiting for for a very long time. So I think there would be more support to somebody who was multicultural, perhaps with a parent that was an immigrant who grew up with English as a first language. But in the 90s and the early 2000s, when I was coming into my own, I had to go on my own and, as you say, go into the bush on my own and, um, and in a very haphazard way. It wasn't like I had real plans or real guidance. I did go with my mother each and every time. And my mother herself was able to return back to Peru for the first time in 30 years after she married my father. Uh -huh. So it was deeply personal. Every single trip I've taken to Peru has been with my mom as my guide. That's and nice. she will pick where we will go. Everywhere we go, wind instruments are all over the place. Of every size, every register, played mostly by men, but more women now, played by the, the more criollo Spanish people, the more Indio people. There's a town called Chincha, very famous for it. It's um, Black and Chinese culture. And they have a huge tradition of wind playing music. For a small country, the culture is unbelievable. The colors just pop everywhere you go. And so you can't help but come back to the US with clearer eyes when we talk about race representation and class and the purpose of art when even in Peru, what is a professional? I mean, a lot of people play music and a lot of people will just pick up a gig, you know, and, and then go to their day job and the, the edges are blurred, they're different. Uh -huh. So it gives me a lot to hang my composer's imagination on. And the wind instrument is the quinta, it's a quintessential musical expression of Peru. Perhaps second or close would be guitars and percussion, but I think wind is number one. Any of the wind instruments. So do we. Carol, maybe you would like to ask Gabriella a question. I know you had notation questions. <laughs> How did she get the music from her head to your page? Exactly, because I love folk music so extraordinarily, I mean, the degree, because I grew up with Slavic music around me all the time and Irish on my mother's side. So I love that you wanted to portray the muscle of the flute, the muscly sound of the flute, which is sharply contrasted by those extraordinary pinississimi, you know, but also that, you know, on the modern instrument, the modern flute, there's such a tendency to distort you know, when we want to play really, uh, you know, with real grit and muscle. So I found that that was a challenge so as not to distort too much. But was it all right? I mean, there is distortion in the playback because of Zoom. But did did I come close? I mean, I, I love and also this sort of angular uh, way that you have these jabs and these sort of like volcanic eruptions. Uh, my niece married a Guatemalan and we spent a lot of time there. And I think the drama of the landscape for sure, that's what I kept sensing. And of course you had your notes of what to do, but that muscly aspect, to, just tell me, was I close? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> that's an easy answer. Yes, you were close. <laughs> that's uh, what you asked. Here, you know, here's the thing also, I got into composing in a really visceral way. Back in the day, I could really play piano, that is. And I got my, my entry through improvising on the piano and learned that there was a thing about composing later. But I don't think interpretation is that far off from composing. I really don't. When I started to make that realization was when, when I was in school at Shepherd School. That's where I, I know Carol. And Carol was one, of, was one of the cool, hip, younger teachers when I was a, a teenager studying there. And years ago, Carol, my goodness. I know. And one of the things that blew me away was when I started just sitting in a fly on the wall and great chamber music coachings of the great works, largely by the string faculty is what I had access to, was I realized that they were walking in the steps of the composer and recomposing it. And that I had to 
make sure that I composed music that allowed that vast wiggle room for all kinds of interpretations. I think that's the greatest compliment you can give to a composer. You look at Shakespeare or Beethoven, there are hundreds, thousands of interpretations of the same work. So if your music is so anemic that it only invites in one or two interpretations, then I think something is remiss. So yes, <laughs> you're more than close. <laughs> Well, that's what I love about working with living composers is extraordinary to have that hotline right there, you know, and uh, I, I know it was very difficult to be, you know, to get through to you when this was all going on. So Brian and I had many questions. So that's very gratifying to know. I do remember in the article in the November issue of the uh, Flu Club that you yourself said, the requirement is to listen again and again. And today I was hearing others, other wonderful things that I think the, the fantastical and the mystery, the, 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 the fog, the, the mist in the valleys, the, you know, the sharpness of the heat of the sun, it was all there, right there. And I thank you so much. <laughs> Perhaps we can go to the other piece, the Mars piece, which is really, really very different not only one movement instead of five, but the mood is much more co concentrated and inner. I, you will see, we will hear. Beautiful, bravo, bravo, bravo. Uh, I'd like to ask you, Damari, did you uh, get what you expected from Gabriella? You knew of you. You commissioned her because you loved her music that you already knew. How was this different from what you'd heard before, or the same? Um, how was it different? I wasn't expecting anything the same. Um, I I was a, a fan, definitely, of the source. I, I was um, familiar with 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 her music and I loved it. And um, it was impossible for me to receive something that I wouldn't like, <laughs> really. I mean, I, I, uh, my mind in this particular case didn't work that way. It doesn't work, work that way. Um, it's like asking someone, you know, what do you have to say about that? And then not liking what you wanna hear. I mean, I, I, I wanted, I wanted to, I wanted. You wanted to know what she would say to you. No, I wanted her. I wanted her voice, and um, and and I got it. It's a terrific yeah. piece, really, really. You do, Gabriella, love those soft high notes. <laughs> so, well, you, um, when you've got players that can pull high notes out and bring them out of nothing and take them to nothing, it's. You don't show composers those kinds of things unless you're ready to to be playing with those kinds of sounds. So um, they become irresistible. And you know what what are considered difficult or at the outer registers of one's technique in a generation are no longer that. So you know between the abilities of performers and the imagination of the composer, who is told that the sky is the limit. This is how repertoire grows and develops. These are real additions to our repertoire. Damari, do you have a, any question you would like to ask Gabriella about notation or mood or in, not interpretation? We, that's yours. Too late for that. Right, right. <laughs> but it's, never, it's never too late, but I, 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 it's not a question. I do have something to say. I'm happy to hear your views on interpre interpretation, Gabriella. How's my volume, by the way? We never did a, a check. Can you hear me? Great. So I'm, I'm glad, um, grateful to hear your views and interpretation because when um, I was rehearsing this, a couple of times this, this came up that I, I had a, a certain, a very specific idea of how I felt uh, things should be going. And, you know, I know this is really inspired by your Peruvian roots. But I just, it was, I just couldn't let go of, of what the music actually meant to me and my roots. It's like, I just couldn't 